So, so Max, in, uh, do you mind if I call you Mario from now on? Because you're, <laughs> if you're Mario in the in the computer game, starts uh, with M A. So I guess I get we grateful <laughs> for the two letters I get. Yeah. Uh, I, I imagine Mario, someone coming into a Mario game and calculating how high he jumps and how fast he runs and coming up with the laws of physics of the game and possibly then questioning why is it that and not something else, perhaps. And so is there, fine, but is there, why would that allow someone in the game to have any understanding of what's outside the game? Yeah, that's a really deep, deep and good question. <clears throat> Mario might, if Mario can never, if he, even if he figures out exactly the rules of his world, then he just he figures won't out even the know rules. if he's running on a Mac or a Windows box or a Linux box, right? Because all he has access to is this higher level of a, this sort of emergent reality. We might, at some level, be stuck in that situation in physics also. It's, it's quite fascinating to think that so much of what we figured out, for example, about how a glass of water works with waves and vortices and things, we figured out already without having a clue of, about the substrate. We didn't even know there were atoms, you know. But the same kind of, of questions that you're asking, which I think are awesome, the kind of questions where you ask, suppose this is actually somehow simulated, suppose the simulator is cutting corners, how would that show up? Actually, it has been incredibly useful in the past. You know, if, if you're trying to, if you imagine going back 200 years and trying to simulate this water as an infinitely... Uh, the continuous liquid where there's a pressure and a density that has to be defined with infinitely many decimal places and infinitely many points, that sounds horrible to simulate. So maybe they, maybe whoever did that cut corners, maybe there's the smallest kind of chunk of object, let's call it atom or something. You can figure out then what are the kind of departures from this simplified continuous physics that I'm guilty of teaching my undergrads at MIT about this this morning, uh, and you would figure out, wait, there's this he one little down thing just different. A few hours ago from yep. Cambridge. Brownian, Thank you for coming in. For Brownian this. motion that things should jiggle around in a sort of weird way, and, and Einstein found that. You know, we got the Nobel Prize for it partly. And the, I think that the sort of thing you're doing is awesome. Look for corner cutting evidence. Uh, I, I suspect that whether we're simulated or not, there are a lot of things that are wrong about what we assume today. I am very skeptical that. We really have a continuous space that can be stretched infinitely many times. It seems like some sort of simplification that we came up because it was easier to do the, with because it was easier to do the math. But do you ever um, ask why should that be the case? Why do we need a discretized universe? I mean, if if you put away the simulation hypothesis or a computational hypothesis, why should we even think about a discretized universe? Why not continuum? So this is th this is an important yeah. Uh, uh, I don't want to call it a problem in physics, but a reality of physics, that our macroscopic world looks continuous to us, and that has a certain simplicity of modeling. And then as you get smaller and smaller and smaller, it's no longer continuous. And it's discrete, which may be easier to calculate than being able to be divisible all the right. way down to an infinitesimally small bit, because now you need that much bigger a computer to do it. By the way, we have. So you we know something that none of us actually know. This is actually a real question: whether space is discrete at really small scale. Well, we we run into this problem when we do flyovers in the Hayden Planetarium. We have a data set for a planetary surface, let's say Mars, and you're at a given distance. And from that distance, you can see Olympus Mons, the biggest mountain around, and and Valles Marineris. And you say, fine. Now I want to get closer. Well, to get closer and have more information come to you, you have to swap in a higher resolution map. And we try to do that continuously so you don't realize that. So you keep doing this, and then you reach a point where we don't have more resolution to give you. So we actually hold you back so you don't go closer. But if you did, all of a sudden you see these discretized uh, pixels of the Martian surface. And that's basically because we don't have the data. We're not there. It doesn't exist for us. So anyone who's used one of these virtual reality devices like the Oculus Rift knows there's something called the screen door effect. It's like you can see, ah, if you look closely enough, you can see the pixels. So it's not, it's not, a, perfect, um, it's not a perfect simulation. So I guess really what, what Zori is doing is saying, well, we could get empirical evidence for a screen door effect 
in real uh, in real physics. Yeah, I think it's, it's actually a deeper question than that. It's not about not having enough data to resolve those distances. That to some extent that's true, but the problem is that it's something that even bothered Feynman a lot. That why do you need infinite numbers of degrees of freedom or infinite amount of information to describe a very tiny chunk of a space time? That just doesn't make sense. It, yeah. You can pretty well describe the physics without actually needing that infinite amount of information. What I meant to add is that when we're zoomed down to Mars, it's not only that we don't have the data, even if we did have the data, you would need that much bigger disk space to have it ready and loaded to be able to go from a, 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 the bird's eye view down to any kind of small, I mean, we, we rapidly run out of capacity to calculate. And that's a great controversy that even mathematicians have been really arguing passionately about for over 100 years. Like Gauss, one of the greatest mathematicians ever, said, you know, or Kronecker actually said that he had, oh, God created the integers and everything else is just the work of man and all these continuous real numbers with decimal places and stuff. And I mean, frankly, as a physicist, it feels kind of hubristic that even though, that, you know, to say that you need an infinite amount of information to figure out the height of my wine glass or, or anything. Nature seems to perfectly There's water to in that figure glass, out what's, by the way. Yeah, yeah, what to do. And, and, and yet, <laughs> we have this toy model that you need an infinite amount of information to do things. I, I, I think you're, you're onto something very deep there, Zora, and, and that nature actually, that infinity is just something we made up for convenience. And as we dig deeper, we're going to find that maybe even space and time itself comes in... <clears throat> is at some level digital. So can I just say something by way of clarification, which is just in physics, um, we don't actually prove any theory. We can rule out theories. So you can rule out a lot of alternative theories, but in any case, you can always have a possibility that you can dig deeper and find that your, whatever theory you thought was the most fundamental has some underlying structure. And so that's why all the physics we've done works. That's why we really don't need to have an infinite amount of information at any time because we don't have access to an infinite amount of information. And we can't even ask the question or tell whether or not there's this underlying infinite amount of information. So it's not just we can't just ask the question whether the universe is simulation. We can't ask if any physical theory is absolutely correct. We'll never know the answer to that. All we can know is that we've tested it up to a certain level at a certain level of precision over a certain range. And so these questions all come with it, and that's why I can describe this glass of water without knowing about atoms, because I didn't have, wasn't doing an experiment where the effects of the atoms became manifest. And the same might be true of the universe as a whole. So we can have in the back of our mind, there may or may not be an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but that's not what we're actually testing. Just to disagree on one thing, though. I think there's one fantastic example where we can tell it makes a huge difference. I think the biggest embarrassment we have, arguably, in, in fundamental physics and cosmology right now is this fact that inflation, if it goes on forever, it makes this multiverse, and then we can't calculate probabilities, like you so eloquently said in the beginning. That comes exactly from the infinity assumption. The idea that you can take a piece of space and just keep stretching it into twice the size, you know, forever. So, well, it I think we should question infinite. that. It could just be a large number. It could be 10 to the 500. I mean, it doesn't really matter if we say it's infinite oh. or we just say it's a lot. But you can calculate probabilities as long as it never gets infinite. It's, it's exactly the infinity that kind of... Really so he's cool with 10 to the 500 us. is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like a really big... I know. That like equals infinity to me, I think. <laughs> but that's exactly the point. 